We are back boys, we are back with season 2 of Revenge of the Iron-Blooded Swordhound. We begin this season on the day when people flock to the city of water, Venesior. It is the capital city of the great empire, Rock. The day of Colossio Academy's entrance ceremony, the world's most prestigious university where our boy, Vikir will be attending. As usual, the first day is buzzing with the academy's club recruitments. Freshmen and seniors of the school are all mixed together. The seniors are seen talking to every freshman that walked by their club stall, trying their best to recruit them. Even asking for a moment to fill surveys, and revealing that all they needed was to stamp their fingerprint and register their seals to join their recruitment form. The seniors were already feeling the heat as the freshman recruitment was more competitive than last year. Another senior reveals that the reason behind that was because of this year's freshmen for both the Fire Corps and Ice Corps, which were no joke at all. In this prestigious school, there are two classes in the academy. The first one being the Ice Corps, who are the members that specialize in swords, bows, spears and more. Whereas, the Fire Corps, were the members who specialize in magic. Comment below which side you would join if you were a part of the school. Me, personally, Ice Corps, because of our boy Vikir and the Fang techniques. Moving on, in their four years, besides specializing in those fields, the students also learn all sorts of general knowledge. The seniors had a list filled with the freshmen who were all gaining everyone's attention right now. The first target of the seniors was a blonde kid called Tudor, who comes from the Don Quixote family, who are famous for their spearmanship. The second target amongst the freshmen, was a purple-haired girl, called Bianca, who came from the Usher family, not our Usher who sang Somebody to Love with Justin Bieber, but from a family that is famous for their bowmanship. Tudor and Bianca were the freshmen who were tied in first place during the Ice Corps practical exam, and are the first on the most desired people list. After them, are our favorite triplets, taking third, fourth and fifth place, are the Baskerville triplets from the Iron Blood Swordsman family. Since they were a part of the Baskerville family, the seniors knew that no further explanation was needed in introducing them. And finally, introducing another new character to the series, we have one person who has been gaining all the attention in the Fire Corps. An extremely talented freshman, by the name of Sinclair, who has ash-gray hair, she was ranked first in the practical test and second in the theory test. Her outstanding grades were recorded. And lastly, the man we have been waiting for months, the person, whose name turns out to be the number one student who came first in the theory exam. Vikir, who kind of looks like a nerd right now. We are now faced with a new look, Vikir with glasses, comment below what you would rate his current look out of 10 right now. As our boy walked through the stalls of the school, he overhears the seniors talking about how there was no need to recruit the nerd that came in first during the theory exam. Since they were confident that he would be the type of newbie that will ruin the club's atmosphere. Plus, there were also more than 10 other freshmen who had the same name as Vikir, which would make it troublesome for them to find him. After hearing the seniors speaking about him, Vikir had a nervous sweat drop dripping down the side of his face. In order not to draw attention in the academy, he had ditched the Baskerville surname and entered as a commoner, but he still didn't think it was possible that he would still draw so much attention. Vikir had heard that it's more difficult to enter the academy as a commoner, so it seems like doing well in the theory exam instead of the practical backfired on him. So now, he needed to do his best to avoid attention, in order to move around comfortably and to do the things he needed. But as he walked through the clubs, our boy was being closely followed by the triplet hounds, who were determined to protect their master. After walking for some time around the clubs, a loud commotion of students shouting for a senior to look at them catches his attention. A familiar blonde hair student was being swarmed by everyone, shouting at her that they were huge fans, and some even claimed to have entered the school just to meet her. They couldn't believe the holiness that was coming out of her and that her beauty was something out of this world. It turns out to be Dolores Lune Quo Vadis, the priestess that Vikir had met during his Assassin Creed days. She was nervous, being surrounded by a huge crowd of students, so she politely told them to calm down. It turns out that she was school president and vice president of the newspaper club. As she questions the crowd of students about whether they were interested in joining her newspaper club, one of them shouts with a reply that they were only interested in her. Vikir silently watches her from the back, slowly remembering that Dolores was the school president, and someone that he needed to avoid as much as possible. Even though he was hiding his presence, Dolores still somehow manages to sense our boy's aura, turning in the right direction, just in time to see him leaving the area silently. We now turn to see the academy's dorm rooms, where Vikir would be staying. He stands in front of a room's door, wondering if this was it. But as he thinks about it, another person approaches him, asking Vikir if the room he was standing outside of was his. The person was excited to finally meet his roommate, catching Vikir's attention. 
Vikir's roommate turns out to be a young-looking boy, with a bowl haircut, who introduces himself as PG. Vikir was stunned by the excitement coming out from PG, as our boy actually remembers him from his previous life. Before Vikir had regressed, PG was always a kind guy who helped him and gave him things, while he was here to support the triplets. But Vikir also remembered that PG was being bullied by his wicked roommate back then. Which was the start of the numerous misfortunes that would eventually lead to his end. As they entered the room together, Vikir hoped silently, in his heart, that whatever happened back then, wouldn't come back to this lifetime. PG was excited, informing Vikir that he could choose any bunk bed that he wanted in the room. He even asks our boy if he was going to the freshman welcome party after dinner. Sensing that it was a stupid question, PG reveals that the party wasn't compulsory but all the freshmen would be going there, since if he couldn't get close with his peers or seniors, he expected that their four years in school would be difficult. But Vikir replies with a simple nope, I'm not going, which leaves PG in a completely shocked state. He tries his best to change Vikir's mind about not going, warning him that if he doesn't, the seniors will single him out, and that will eventually lead him to become a loner amongst his peers. He doesn't stop there, he even tells Vikir that a lot of their distinguished seniors were going to come to this orientation. Even the saintest Dolores was coming too. He also mentions their peers, Tudor, the eldest son of Don Quixote, and Bianca, the eldest daughter of the Usher family, which Vikir should have heard about. But that's not all, he even mentions that the Baskerville's triplets were coming, who were all talented. Along with, somebody called Sancho from the North Mercenary Guild, who rejected the top spot at Varangan to come to their school instead. He finally mentions Sinclair, the student who passed the exam with the highest score at the Magic Tower, and who also came in first for the Fire Corps. Vikir couldn't help but be overwhelmed by the sudden information bomb that came from PG, in his mind, he recalls that PG was also great at collecting and analyzing information in his previous life too. After bombarding Vikir with all the knowledge in his tiny head, PG hopes that it changes his decision about not going. But our boy was cold as ice, replying back with the same old answer, a simple nope. Bringing horror and shock to PG's face as he wonders why Vikir still wouldn't go, even after knowing about what would happen to him. But our boy doesn't care, turning around to leave and explaining that he just didn't want to go. He waves PG goodbye and tells him to have fun, leaving him stunned but impressed, as PG vowed to be as cool as Vikir one day. Deep within the night as the moon shines brightly, a familiar figure stood high above on the roof of a building, basking in the moonlight. Down below where he stood, a small hint of light could be seen in the alleyways between the buildings. A group of thugs were gathered around a barrel used for fire, the one sitting on the bench was arguing to his two companions, saying that he was relieved that he didn't have to hear those children whining anymore. He continues to complain to them, revealing that all their storerooms had been filled with children recently, making the other two wonder why all the children were coming to them and that a carriage had arrived at dawn and taken all of them. One of them heard that the children they had taken were all headed to an orphanage in Quo Vadis, but the thug sitting on the bench warns him to not say anything more, since curiosity kills the cat. As they were talking, another person approached them, with blades on his back. He orders them to stop chit-chatting amongst themselves and to stand guard properly, if they want to get properly paid for their useless existence. Ouch, talk about a mean boss. This man with slashes down his eyes and his tongue sticking out is called Ron Batison, nicknamed the Flesh Grinder. The thugs were obviously afraid of him as he walked past them, he continued to trash talk them, literally calling them pieces of trash and telling them that they don't possess any fighting spirit. He knew that as a graduator, these pieces of trash, who were low rank mercenaries, without an ounce of mana in their bodies, could never do anything against him. Ron continues to wonder to himself if there was anyone strong that he could slice up, but as he was talking to himself, a familiar voice asks him if his name was Ron Batison. Thinking that it was one of the low rank mercenaries who dares to speak his name with their weak lips, he immediately grabs onto his sword to give him a spanking. But upon turning around, he finds all three of them completely knocked out around the barrel of fire. The man started to feel afraid, as he didn't even hear a single sound from when they were knocked out. The voice continues to speak to him, revealing his full name to be Ron Humbert Batison. Recounting that four years ago, he had killed his neighboring family and used them as sacrifices, while contracting with a known demon. The voice continues to recall Ron's history, after sacrificing the family. He had joined the Northern Guild Association, and had gathered information to give to the demon he contracted with. As the final nail to the coffin, the voice reveals that Ron had extracted information from the Mankind Allied Forces. While he was on guard duty, he used a hand mirror and revealed the location of the platoon's camp. Even after hearing all the things he had done, 
Ron tells the voice to stop saying useless things and to show himself instead. Agreeing with his request, our boy finally makes his appearance in his Assassin Creed outfit, right behind Ron. Revealing that because of Ron, the alley platoon was slaughtered. Finally sensing that someone was behind him, Ron didn't reply back, but simply swung his twin swords as hard as he could at where Vikir was standing. He thought he had felt the sensation of cutting something, which made him confused as it was too easy. It turns out to be true, because in the next moment, both of Ron's arms were sliced away from his shoulder in a second, before he could even respond to the attack. Vikir is already done with him as he returns Beelzebub back into his hand, after appearing behind Ron once again and slicing both of his arms instantly. Leaving Ron on the ground, crying and screaming in pain over the loss of his arms. He starts to beg for mercy, telling Vikir that he didn't know about the mankind allied forces, which made him wonder why he was doing this to him. Our boy simply replies that Ron didn't know about it, because it hadn't happened yet. He holds Ron by his hair, and stares right into his soul, revealing that he knows that he had contracted with a demon, and wants the information on the contracted demon. But as soon as Ron starts to speak, telling Vikir about how he didn't know, the shape of his face starts to twist and bend, in an ugly way. The next thing Vikir knew, Ron's face had become all swollen and exploded into a bloody mess. Looking at the current state of Ron, Vikir noted that another one had died with their head exploding. He then takes out a notebook, with words written on the pages, some were covered in a black stroke line. With a bloody finger, Vikir crosses out another name with the blood, noting that Ron makes the third in the row. It turns out that the book our boy is holding is called The Blacklist, this was something that was created with the memories of his past life and with the help of Cindy's investigation. The Blacklist contains information about the demon worshippers who sided with the demons and betrayed mankind. Before the time of the fall, Vikir needed to kill them all. He recalled that the three demon worshippers he encountered so far, had all died with their heads exploding before he could kill them. Thinking about it deeply, Vikir concluded that this was the demon's skill. Which means that the demon they contracted with, was hiding within the capital. And that it was one of the ten elite corpses who had done the contracting with the humans. As we continued into the night, the bell of a church started to ring, with each chime, the sounds of slashing were hidden. We turned to a random building in the town, where Vikir stood near the balcony. Behind him, were endless amounts of bodies, each having a part of their body sliced off, their blood splattered everywhere, from the floors to the walls and to the ceilings. Absorbing Beelzebub back into his hand, Vikir wonders if the amount of demon worshippers he had slain so far had reached number 29. Based on everything so far, he concluded that they were either dead, or if they mentioned the demon they had a contract with, their heads would explode. Which makes it look like a condition of the demon contract. Crossing out the names in his blacklist with a pen this time, Vikir noted that he wasn't able to get any information about the elite corpse's location, which means that this was going to be a long and excruciating fight for him. In the end, he didn't expect to get anything on his first day. As the night continues, Vikir wonders if he should return to the academy right now. And so our boy leaps across the roofs of the town's buildings, eventually crossing over the walls of the academy. As he lands on the branch of a tree, he gazes into a well-lit room. Staring deep within, Vikir could see that the freshman welcome party was still ongoing. As he leaps down from the tree, and dusts the dirt off his pants, our boy wears his nerd disguise once again. Thinking that he should stop by at the party just in case. Inside the freshman welcome party, the students were happily talking to one another and eating the food from the buffet table. Even the triplets were enjoying themselves, chugging down huge cups of beer all at once, leaving everyone around them impressed. Dolores was once again surrounded by her fans, who screamed at her, proclaiming their love for her. Tudor was surrounded by the ladies while Bianca was pouring glasses of wine for her seniors as a sign of respect. Vikir stood alone in the back, analyzing the situation. He notices Tudor and Bianca in the party, he didn't know that they were in the same year as him. In his previous life, the great heroes who led mankind to victory with Karmas morgued during the time of the fall. One of them was the person who stood at the front line of the battlefield and took charge from one of the seven greatest families, the Azure Spearman family, Don Quixote's genius. Tudor La Mancha Don Quixote, the blonde playboy right now, and the archer who defeated countless demons, from one of the seven greatest families, the mystical archer family, Usher's genius, not Justin Bieber, but Bianca Faux Usher. Besides those two, Vikir was able to recognize a lot of faces he saw on the battlefield. He smiles to himself over this sight, as he didn't expect that he would see them like this. But as he looks around the party again, he wonders if Karmas Morg had entered the academy too. 
But as he did, PG was shaking as someone asked if they should get some music going. It turns out that PG was being bullied by a senior who was forcing him to sing right now. Vikir could spot our little boy surrounded by a whole group of seniors that were bigger than him. As he refused to sing, a female senior approaches him this time, bringing along a massive jug of alcohol and telling PG that if he doesn't want to sing, then he has to drink this entire cup in one go. Tears started to form around his eyes as PG questioned the senior about how he was going to drink all of it. But the seniors didn't care about what he was feeling, repeating to PG that he should just drink. Sensing that he couldn't back away from their request, after all, they were his seniors, our little man decided to do as they wanted. And begins to chug down the massive jug of alcohol they had brought for him in one go. As he continued to try his best to drink most of it, the seniors were laughing at him, and mocking PG by telling him that he was doing a good job. But before he could finish all of it, he threw up on the floor. Instead of helping him, the seniors continued to make fun of PG, calling him a crazy bastard for vomiting which they found disgusting. As he tries his best to catch his breath, PG could hear the seniors making up a new nickname for him, they decided to call him the Vomit Pig. In his time of need, a hero appears. Our boy, Vikir, uses his own cape to cover the vomit that was on the floor, surprising the seniors. As they wondered who this nerdy boy was in front of them. Vikir looks over to PG, deep in thought. Thinking about him in his previous life, Vikir knew that PG had dropped out of school because he couldn't endure the bullying. Instead of graduating, he had become a low-ranked government official and lived a tough life while looking after his parents. The next time Vikir had met PG was when they were at the front line of the war, after the time of the fall had started. PG was one of the few people who had the balls to volunteer to go to the front lines, with his amazing strategy and information analysis, he had saved multiple lives. One of those lives was our boy, Vikir. It turns out that this little man was one of the few people that Vikir had respected as a friend. Still stunned upon seeing Vikir, our boy tells him to return to the dorm room first, as he was going to take care of things here. Vikir couldn't just stand idly by while his friend gets humiliated. A senior places his hand onto Vikir's shoulder, asking him about what he was doing and if he was crazy for interrupting a senior when they were talking. The senior takes it a step further, slapping Vikir's face repeatedly till it turns red, asking our boy if he was PG's classmate from Ice Core Class B, after seeing our boy arrogantly step in like he was confident. But this senior made a huge mistake, as the triplets of the Baskerville clan finally made their appearance once again, all three of them had their eyes lit up with bloodhound aura, fueled by anger, as they witnessed the senior slapping their master. Vikir was still calm and collected, as he pushed his glasses up, his own pair of bloodhound eyes started to light up as he stared at them. The triplets immediately calmed down after recalling the warning they had received from Vikir. He told them before that he was going as a commoner at the academy, and that he would kill them the moment they reveal his identity. A female senior joins in, telling her friend that they shouldn't be rough on the freshmen and instead, they should treat them nicely as their seniors. She then comes up with a nice idea, saying that it would do the trick for them. She offers Vikir a chance. The seniors were willing to let both of them go, if he could drink all of the alcohol that was in the jug in front of them. Not wanting to pull our boy into his problems, PG tells Vikir that he was actually fine but he ignores his words, and without hesitating, grabs onto the jug of alcohol. And started to pour it down his throat, surprising everyone around him. The female senior was giggling to herself, knowing that the jug was a mixed drink with high alcohol content, containing vodka and rum. So she was confident that there was no way a human could drink more than one liter of it at once. But she underestimates our boy, as he continues to chug down the drink without stopping, leaving the seniors all stunned and shocked. After some time, he slams the empty jug onto a nearby table, wiping off the remains on his mouth. Without wasting any more time, Vikir grabs onto PG and leaves with him simply telling the seniors that were stunned by what they just saw, a single word, bye. But before they could leave peacefully, the same senior that was slapping Vikir's face grabs onto his shoulder, telling him to wait. The moment he does, Tudor and Bianca were the first to experience a horrifying and powerful feeling crushing them. The aura that our boy had been hiding up to now, with an ice-cold stare, and his eyes lit up, Vikir looks at the senior, asking him if he wanted anything else. But the senior was too stunned to speak, shaking from head to toe as his mouth was left wide open. That's when Dolores makes her appearance, asking everyone present about why it was so chaotic over here. The seniors were quick to cover their tracks, telling her that a freshman had vomited and that they were going to take care of it. Dolores senses something was wrong, and warns them that they couldn't treat the freshmen cruelly as they needed to uphold the image of the academy. Seeing that she was taking care of things from here on, 
Vikir hurries away with PG in his arms. The triplets on the other hand were impressed by their master, after witnessing the things he had done, giving him three thumbs up and calling him cool. Tudor and Bianca were both staring in the same direction, and thinking that they were mistaken about what they felt earlier on. But another student with white hair stood between them, smiling to herself over and was impressed by something. Her eyes were sparkling as her face was filled with blush, it turns out to be Sinclair, the freshman who ranked first in the Ice Corps practical exam and ranked second in the theory exam. She watches closely as Vikir leaves the party with PG, thinking to herself that she had found someone nice. After the incident at the freshman welcome party, we come to the next day, where at the academy, the Ice and Fire Corps attend classes together. Through this method, a competitive structure is created for the confident elites. This increases focus among students and it is the academy's policy. The man who looks like Professor Snape from Harry Potter, closes the book in his hand. Which marks the end of his lecture on the culture of the barbarian tribe. This Snape wannabe is the combat theory professor known as Ven C. Morg, from the Morg family. As he continues to talk to the students, he asks them a question, which causes most of them to avoid eye contact with him in order not to catch his attention. The professor states that with the basis of the discovered locations of the barbarian tribe, he wanted to ask if there was anyone in the classroom who would like to tell him about the barbarians' hypothesized location of their stronghold. Even Tudor, who belonged to the Ice Corps and was ranked first in the practical exam, had some trouble with the professor's question. He looks through his notes, thinking about the location of the clash between the barbarians and the Empire which was at the South Region's front in Highland, 1, 8 and 75. But there were more places that he struggles to remember. Bianca, who is also a part of the Ice Corps and tied with Tudor in placing first in the practical exam, struggles with the question. Thinking about it deeply, she knew that the areas where the Empire and the Balak tribe clashed were all in low attitude locations and considering that it was a trough, she concluded that the barbarians tribe's stronghold would be in a region with low altitude as well. But as the two people who ranked first in the practical exam struggle to come up with an answer, Sinclair bursts in. Raising her hand high in the air while radiating a bright aura all around her, catching everyone's attention as she screams at the top of her lungs that she was going to answer. Sinclair belongs to the Fire Corps, is currently ranked first in their practical exam, and ranked second in the theory exam. Looking at the student who happily raised her hand to answer, Professor Vency concluded that she was Sinclair, ranked first of the Fire Corps, and told her to go ahead and reveal her answer to everyone in class. Sinclair spoke about how in the military, according to the published academia, the location of the close fight between the barbarian tribe and the empire were in Highlands 1, 4, 5, 7, 8, 30, 75, and 207. She also spoke about how excluding the 8th Highland which is on a high mountain peak, all of the areas were in troughs, with all that information. As she continued on with her answer, Vikir was spotted, sitting one row behind her. But his eyes were closed as PG stared at him. Instead of sleeping, Vikir was deep in thought. Going through his mind were the events of last night. Yesterday marked the 29 times he had slain demon worshippers in the city, something they had in common was that they all possessed a severe stench of demons, and before they died, their so-called faces exploded into a bloody mess each time. Face and explode, with these two facts, Vikir thought that if that was the skill of the elite corpse that was hiding in this capital city, then there was only place he could think of that it would be hiding itself in. He concluded that he needed to ask Cindy for her help in investigating the area around the place he had in mind, but as he was thinking, PG immediately calls out to Vikir, tapping onto his shoulder in order to grab his attention. Upon opening his eyes, our boy could see that everyone in the class had their eyes focused on him. Professor Snape was furious, stating that the Ice Corps weren't as good as the Fire Corps, as he couldn't believe that there was a student who would dare sleep in the first class of the semester. Flexing his glasses, Vikir responds back to the professor, telling him that he wasn't sleeping, his reply shocked PG. Upset over our boy's arrogant reply, the professor grew even more furious, asking Vikir to reveal his name to him. After knowing his name, the professor stated that everyone in the class saw that his eyes were closed. But our boy was quick with his reply, telling the professor that his eyes were closed, but it didn't mean that he was sleeping. Hearing that kind of reply, the professor eats a humble pie and tells Vikir that he was mistaken. Our boy said it was understandable, making the professor even more furious as he wondered what kind of psycho had entered the academy this time. Failing to break Vikir over his responses, the professor decides to move on. He tells the class that because of the answer that Fire Corps rank 1, Sinclair gave, the Fire Corps have gained 1 point out of 10 for behavior points. The professor then suggested something to Vikir, telling him that if he could answer his question, 
he was going to give him and the Ice Corps the points. However, the professor warns Vikir that if he answers the question wrongly, he was going to give the entire Ice Corps students negative points instead. Our boy simply shouted back that his suggestion was unfair, but the professor didn't care anymore and presented the question. He wanted to know the location of the Empire's military and where the Balak fought. With that location, he wanted Vikir to tell him where the Balak tribe's stronghold is. Sinclair was stunned by the professor's sudden question, she knew that compared to other tribes, information on the Baliks was hard to come by, making the question extremely difficult. Bianca on the other hand, was pissed off at Vikir's arrogant attitude towards the professor, calling him an idiot in his mind, as she believes that everyone in the Ice Corps was going to be at a loss because he couldn't answer the question. Taking the question in mind, Vikir thought about for a while, a memory of the Balak tribe, dancing around a campfire while smiling and having meat in their hands came into his mind. He remembers his barbarian family along with the precious memories he had made with them, just the thought of them makes our boy smile. And so, he calmly answers back to the professor, revealing the location of the fight between the Baliks and the Empire, he spams everyone with accurate information and a strong possible location of the Baliks stronghold. His answer was enough to stun everyone who heard it in the classroom. After ending his answer, Vikir knew that after the Aumann incident, the Baliks had actually shifted their stronghold so telling the class about their old place was no big deal. But his answer was still considered incredible, as PG was left stunned with his mouth wide open upon hearing it. Even Professor Snape was impressed by Vikir's answer as it was exactly spot on. He wonders how it was possible for our boy to know about the thesis that hasn't been verified by the academic world. But as he continues to think about Vikir's answer, the professor soon recalls that a student with the same name had recently placed first in the theory exam. And so, the professor decides to give Vikir 10 points for his answer, while giving the rest of the Ice Corps 1 point each. But after finding out that Vikir had placed first in the theory exam, he decides to humble him by not overlooking the fact that he had closed his eyes during his lesson. So the professor decides to minus 10 points from Vikir. Sinclair was looking at our boy, in her mind, she didn't even notice him because of how common the name Vikir was. Even in his nerd disguise, our boy couldn't hide his aura as she continued to gaze at him while he stood tall, basking in the rays of the sun. Even Tudor was drawn to Vikir as he continues to stare at him from across the classroom, the other students were talking amongst themselves, realizing that Vikir was the one who placed first in the theory exam, but some didn't care, as all of them almost had a negative score in points. They seemed to believe that Vikir was only a nerd, which makes them want to go and punch him in the face. Looking at our boy, Tudor couldn't help but smirk, after finding the smartest person when it comes to theory but he wonders how useful that would be during the practical lessons. We now change scenes to a large football-like field, where the students were playing a game called Run Flat, which uses a special type of ball and gloves. It's a sport with 20 people on each team, points are acquired when the ball is in the other team's goal area. It's against the rules to use mana and weapons. Besides that, it is a game where any method can be used to score goals. The match starts off with a player stomping the ground hard, it turns out to be Tudor, who smashes through the defense line of the opposite team with ease. As he carries the ball to score, he declares to everyone that he was the best when it comes to run flat, and that this was his time to shine. The girls in the stand cheered him on, commenting about how hot he was while Bianca was annoyed, calling the sport barbaric. As Tudor reaches closer to the goal of the enemy team, a familiar three-headed group appears to block his way. It turns out to be the triplets from the Baskerville family, they stand against Tudor together, calling him an arrogant bastard and daring him to try and break through them. Instead of being afraid of the rumored Ironblood Swordsman family's troublemaker triplets, Tudor was excited. Much to the triplets' surprised, he didn't face them head-on, instead, he weaved past two of them easily. Leaving them shocked, but before reaching the end, the last triplet makes his appearance, telling Tudor to hand over the ball. Instead of answering back, Tudor simply prepares his left hand and within a second, a bright blue light appears from it. Wasting no time at all, he slams his fist into the triplet's body, causing what looks like a Rasengan attack to appear on his stomach, knocking him out of his way completely. He tells the triplets that if he had decided to face them head-on, then he was going to lose it all. With only one person alive on the enemy team, Tudor makes a mad dash to the goalpost. After witnessing the powerful move he did, the other students were amazed by him as they could see how strong he was even without any mana or weapons. They had also heard rumors that he was Don Quixote's run flat prodigy, which was expected of the Ice Core Ace. Running to the goal, Tudor was thinking to himself that there was no point in memorizing theories, as a true fighter, all he needed was the strength to win. 
but as he continues to run, he notices something in front of him. It turns out to be our boy Vikir, who was the only member on his team left standing in the way of Tudor. Tudor recognizes Vikir as the student who responded back to Professor Snape in this morning's lecture. Our boy was actually annoyed by what was happening right now, he had told the triplets not to send Tudor on his way, and decided to step aside to let him score. But there's a twist, instead of aiming for the goalpost, Tudor actually decides to mess with Vikir. Thinking that with this body slam, he was going to help Vikir focus more on training his body than studying. Unfazed by what was happening, Vikir showed no reaction at all to Tudor's sudden attack. Instead, he simply stood still, resulting in Tudor falling through the air after he crashed into Vikir. Like a car hitting a wall, it turns out that the impact from crashing into Vikir was enough to knock him out, his face was completely blurred, showing no signs of life. Even Bianca and Sinclair couldn't believe what was going on as they witnessed this sight from the stance. Vikir turns his head to look behind, only to see Tudor finally landing onto the ground with a heavy slam. Thinking about what had just happened, Vikir initially planned on dodging Tudor, but instead, he questions why this blonde kid would just run into him first. Before he could make sense of things, our boy simply fell to the ground as well, moaning loudly in pain because in his mind, he was going to pretend to be injured. The sleeping blonde prince laid on the field completely flat on his back after the incident with Vikir, his face covered in sweat. Moments later, his eyes suddenly opened wide. Tudor was surrounded by his fellow students, as he continued to lay on the ground, confused by what had happened to him. The voices of his classmates asking him if he was okay didn't even register with him, as he wondered what he was doing right now, whether he had fainted or actually fallen asleep during the match. He started to remember what he was doing before seeing the scene in front of him. Tudor had decided during the match to mess with Vikir who ranked first in theory for a bit. He was going to tease him by barging into his shoulder a little, but the moment they made contact, everything went black for him, so he couldn't remember exactly what happened. As he sat up, Tudor looked at Vikir, who was dusting off his body, he couldn't believe that a nerd like him could actually knock out the great Tudor Don Quixote. Seeing that there wasn't even a single scratch on our boy, Tudor was determined to test out what happened just now again. Once more, the game was about to begin with everyone getting into their positions at the start of the match. The ball was once again passed over to Tudor, who was thinking that something was wrong with the incident against Vikir, and so, he wanted to do it again to test his own theory. This time, the triplets of the Baskerville family, immediately stood on guard against Tudor, while also acting like a shield for Vikir, who simply stood at the back of the field. But as soon as the match started, Bianca and Sinclair who were watching from the stands, were confused by what was going on. Instead of going for the goal post, Tudor was aiming right for the triplets and Vikir, ignoring the words from his teammates as he charged towards them instead. Tudor confidently challenges the triplets and Vikir once more, which the triplets happily accept, replying to Tudor that he wasn't going to get past them this time round. Once again, the triplets failed at blocking and intercepting Tudor, who held the ball and got past them easily a second time. His eyes were completely focused on Vikir this round, charging towards our boy at full speed. Vikir watches closely as the blonde kid continues to run in his direction. He thinks about how he had ordered the triplets to keep Tudor away from him, but at the same time, he wonders why Tudor was so serious about coming towards him now. The genius spearman was revved up, his eyes were locked onto our boy, no longer seeing him as human but a target now. Tudor was serious, he knew that what happened to him was no mere coincidence. So he decides to use the Azure Spearman family's run flat secret technique, Saint Spear Tackle. Yes, this powerful family actually created a killer move for a ball game. An avatar of a knight with a powerful lance was summoned behind Tudor as his eyes turned completely blue, determined to smash into Vikir and send him flying in the air this time. Even though such a powerful force was coming straight to his face, Vikir was actually pretty calm, pretty demure. His glasses were showing no signs of fear at all. Soon enough, we cut to black once again. In the next moment, the same gray hair scarred face student appears above Tudor asking him if he was awake again. The blonde prince once again wakes up in his usual T-pose, completely wasted on the ground again. He immediately sat upright, questioning how it was possible for him to faint once more, but as he struggles to understand what was happening, the muscular guy beside him tells him to calm down. He reveals to Tudor that after he used his family's technique, which was hitting Vikir with a high-speed tackle, it simply resulted in him being bounced off our boy at that same high speed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our next challenger as the student who woke up Tudor tightens the headband on his head, he tells Tudor that he understands why he was so focused on Vikir, as our boy was clearly hiding something from them. 
This time, Sancho, the muscular student, was going to go against our boy. With the sun shining brightly on him, he heads over to the match. Telling Tudor that as a man and a friend, he couldn't just watch and do nothing after seeing him get beaten twice by Vikir. This is the transfer student who came from the Mercenary Guild Association in the north, Sancho Barataria. Due to his overwhelming physique, he is not considered eligible for his age group in his league, so he decided not to play run flat. Basically, this guy was too overpowered to play a ball game. But because of Vikir, he changes his mind. As he held onto the ball, Sancho talked about how in the frozen land of the north, newborns of the elderly who are on the verge of death, fight desperately. It means they're all warriors. It's round three for the triplets this time as they faced off against the giant. Determined and hyper-focused, the triplets weren't letting anyone pass them this round. Third time's the charm right? Well, not in this world, because in the next second, instead of dodging and weaving past the triplets like Tudor did twice, Sancho just decides to do the wrestling move and clothesline all three of the hounds together. Sancho easily slams and flings the triplets into the air, pushing and making them fly away from Vikir, who simply stood his ground. As they flew past their master, our boy was pissed off this time, his eyes were glowing red behind his glasses, whispering to the triplets if they wanted to die. The triplets could only cry as they flew past their master once again, apologizing for their third failure in a row while in the air. Even after sending three people in the air, Sancho wasn't stopping his attack. He charges straight at Vikir like a bull. His face was filled with determination, just like how Tudor was from before, in order to reveal what Vikir was hiding from them. Our boy, on the other hand, was still emotionless even before a giant that was rampaging towards him. Just inches away from him this time, Sancho readies himself, telling Vikir that he was going to see if he could endure his full power this time. With his hand raised up high in the air, Sancho lands a full blow onto Vikir's stomach with all his might, causing a loud bang. But the moment he got into contact with our boy, all he could feel and sense was that he was hitting a huge mountain of stone. The feeling in his arm was shocking to Sancho, who was known for his powerful strength, his hand was shaking as he tried to move Vikir by a little bit. Even after being hit by Sancho's full strength, Vikir didn't feel anything at all. Instead, he was thinking that he should play along with what Sancho wanted. So he purposely jumped backwards with a bit of strength, pretending that Sancho's attack had actually done something to him. In order to make sure it was right, Vikir created skid marks on the field with his body, even crashing into the ground like the triplets did. The other students who were watching were amazed by what they witnessed. They couldn't believe that Sancho had broken through the enemy team's defense. But some of them wondered if the guy he pushed was still alive. Unknown to the other students, Sancho, completely aware of what was really going on, couldn't help but stare at his shaking hand, wondering what that feeling was he just experienced and if Vikir was actually human. Distracted by the weird sensation that Vikir gave off, Sancho was unaware that one of the triplets had recovered from his attack, and sneaked up to him. Within seconds, the triplet had stolen the ball from him, and made a mad dash towards the goal. Before long, the referee blows the whistle, announcing the end of the game. It turns out that thanks to the triplets, Vikir's team had won the match. As the team continued to congratulate the triplets on their sneaky win tactic, Vikir finally got off the ground and started to dust himself off. But then someone purrs a bottle of water onto his head. It turns out to be Sancho, who praises Vikir as he knew that he was the secret contributor to Class B's victory. Even Tudor was impressed by our boy, who retired because of their win. He reveals that he had initially planned on teaching Vikir a lesson during the practical lessons because he was jealous, but then came to a realization of how shameful that was, and apologies to our boy for his rude actions from before. Sancho was even more interested in Vikir, asking him about what exercises he did in order to have such a solid build, he even thought that Vikir had used mana during the match. Taking off his headgear, Vikir reveals that he was just a commoner, and didn't have an ounce of mana to use. Tudor was sad to hear that, calling it a shame, if he had received proper training, combined with his current blessed body, then he was sure that Vikir would have been an expert like him. As the three of them chat, Tudor's cheerleading squad arrives, calling out to them to use the towel they brought to wipe their sweat. Once again, the ladies' man was doing his business while Sancho hands Vikir a towel to use. The Azure Spearman family's hero, Tudor, and the mercenary guild's ace, Sancho. One day, they will become heroes who will save mankind by hunting an endless number of demons during the time of the fall. As he took off his glasses, Vikir couldn't help but smile to himself, after all, he found it strange to see that these two gentlemen had a past like this. The moment he reveals his face, everyone around, from guys to girls, were all stunned by what they were looking at. 
even Bianca and Sinclair were blushing hard, while watching from the stands. As our boy wipes the water from his head, basking in the rays of the sun. His toned body etched into his stretch, revealing the fine lines and curves. Everyone couldn't believe how handsome the nerd they knew was underneath the glasses he wore. Unknown to Vikir, he didn't know that from this point onwards, his days at the academy were going to become more troublesome. The scene changes to nighttime, where we chance upon a mansion. A man with a purple goatee was horrified by something, as Vikir's voice could be heard. Revealing that this man is Lloyd Dokseller, 52 years old. Wearing his Assassin Creed uniform, you guys know that it means it was demon hunting time. Multiple dead bodies surrounded the two of them, with the floor covered in blood as pieces of meat were flung everywhere. Vikir cornered the man to a statue, revealed as the leader of the information house and the headmaster of the orphanage. Vikir knew that Lloyd had conspired with the demon he was hunting, and sold children from high-ranked families. Did you think you would go unnoticed? Questioned Vikir as he threatens him with Beelzebub. Lloyd was horrified to see the kind of aura that Vikir was showing off, due to its solid nature. Lloyd thought that Vikir was a swordmaster. Hearing that, the man was almost right, Vikir's aura was pretty much in a solid state, but is still closer to liquid. To be specific, he was currently at the highest level for a graduator. Instead of slicing him into bits, Vikir offers the man a chance at redemption. Telling him to work with him in order to catch the demon, and if he does, Vikir was willing to compensate him accordingly. Even at death's door, Lloyd hesitates to help. As Vikir waited for a reply from the man, something happened. A huge piece of a building was flung in the air right above them. It soon crashes and destroys the very place they were at. Vikir was quick to dodge the impact of the building, and immediately looked up to see a shadowy figure, lighted by the moonlight standing on the remains of the building that was thrown at them. A nasty green aura started to float around our boy, it turns out that this was the overwhelming energy that he had sensed from afar. Looking at the strange figure who wore a mask, while wielding a hammer made out of human faces. Vikir questions him, are you the elite corpse? Even after being asked a question, the mysterious figure didn't say a single word to Vikir. Instead, he simply leapt off the rickety and broken building where he stood. Soaring across the sky, the figure raised his massive hammer, forged out of human face skin. He swiftly swung it down hard towards Vikir, who easily dodged it by moving to the side, but not before the forceful impact of the hammer obliterated the place he was at before. The figure, seeing that its first attack failed to kill our boy, quickly switched his stance on the way he handled his hammer. He grabbed it nearer to the head this time and went into a ferocious close swing at Vikir, who once again dodged by bending it backwards like Beckham. Now face to face with the disgusting hammer by a few inches, Vikir noticed that the figure was adopting a strange battle stance. With a twist at the handle of the hammer, the figure lunged it straight towards Vikir's head, almost decapitating him completely. But all the attacks couldn't land on our boy, as he simply bounced effortlessly away from him this time. Standing on guard, Vikir was able to quickly analyze the unique characteristics of the opponent he was fighting right now. He could sense the aura of a high-ranked graduator emanating from it and noticed that the figure uses the religiously holy Quo Vadis bludgeoning technique, that was seen just moments ago. Combining all these facts together, Vikir realized that the mysterious figure in front of him was not the elite corpse he had been hunting for these past few days. This made him wonder, did a demon infiltrate the religiously holy nation? But knowing them, he knew about how they had their own corrupt sectors too. This made him think that the guy in front of him right now was simply a servant who works under the ten elite corpses. Unsummoning Beelzebub back into his hand, Vikir tells the figure that if he kills him, then he might be able to meet the ten elite corpses. Him coming here was perfect for our boy, since he was getting annoyed from having to constantly get rid of trash like before. But this time was different, he could actually let loose for a while. After saying that, the man with the hammer leapt gracefully into the air again, hoping to land a blow onto our boy. This time, there was an impact, the sound was loud enough to send shockwaves through the air. It turns out that instead of using his blade, Vikir was going in for close combat. He blocked the massive hammer strike by just using one of his legs, doing a horizontal leg split, Jean-Claude Van Damme style. Instead of your typical shouting of the word, what, the masked figure simply lets out a grunt noise, surprised that its attack was stopped by a single leg. But wait, there's more. Vikir was on the attack this time he charged his arm with the blood-red aura of the Baskerville power. In just one second, he managed to land five Rasengan-like injuries onto the masked figure's body, before ending the attack with a powerful right hook to the side of its ribs. Sending it flying into the nearby abandoned building, as it enters the building, the masked figure seems to be able to withstand Vikir's powerful blows. 
Wasting no time at all, our boy also leaps into the building, following closely behind. As the masked figure tried to prepare another attack with a swing of his hammer, our boy was way faster. In an instant, he snapped the arm of the masked figure so fast that it couldn't even react to the attack. With only its right arm on the hammer, Vikir teleported behind it in an instant, with swift and deadly precision. He elbows and knees the masked figure's only remaining working arm, breaking it completely like its other arm. Even after breaking both of them, Vikir isn't done, he flips over, grabs its shirt, and flings it to the other side of the room. It turns out that his final throw had meaning behind it, as the masked figure was impaled by a sharp iron pipe that was hidden in the building's walls. The only sound it could make was some grunting noises as Vikir slowly walked over to its side. Looking closer at its exposed chest, he could see huge scar marks all over and the word, Afibo, imprinted on its skin, which makes him think that that was its name. Seeing that Afibo could no longer escape, Vikir starts to question him, asking him about his master and the person responsible for making him this way. But no human words came out from his mouth, only the sounds of groaning. Hearing him struggle to answer, Vikir could sense that the person who made him this way might have been controlling what he could say. Reaching out to the steel rod that impaled Afibo, Vikir lets him know that interrogation can also come in other forms, besides words. Twisting the steel rod, Vikir tells Afibo while causing him even more pain that he was going to slice his body into smaller pieces, along with his intestines, bone structures, and injuries. All the information he needed was in the freshness of the blood in his veins and the concentration of his mana, those things would tell Vikir a lot of things. And so, as the night goes on, in this beautiful moonlight, Vikir tells Afibo that the interrogation of his life was about to begin. After the interrogation went on for quite some time, Vikir could hear the sounds of someone calling for help coming from the rubble in the middle of the square from before. So he went to check out what it was. Upon lifting up the rocks, he saw that Lyad had actually somehow survived the attack from Afibo, where he threw the building at them from the start. Knowing that he was actually a poison seller, Vikir reminds the frightened man that if he wanted to live, then he should know what he has to do, which was to tell our boy everything he needed to know. Unlike before, Lloyd was actually considering helping Vikir, asking him if in exchange he would spare his life, but Vikir warns him that it would depend on the type of information he provides. As the two of them were busy negotiating, another mysterious figure appeared, standing high above on a building nearby and watching the two of them closely. It turns out to be a human wearing a familiar uniform. Lyad finally breaks and shouts to Vikir that he was going to tell him everything, revealing that in the headmaster's room, there was his safe. But the moment he does, the Sharingan appears, just kidding. This ain't Naruto, or is it? An eye appears with a unique green symbol on it, causing blood stains to appear around the eye as well. The moment the eye appeared, Vikir could sense which direction it came from and turned to see what it was, but it was too late. The mysterious third party had already disappeared from the building's rooftop. After sensing that strange feeling, it somehow feels familiar to our boy. But because his attention was drawn somewhere else, he doesn't notice the fact that Lloyd was busy puking out three other heads from his mouth. Ew, ew, ew. As soon as he turns to see Lloyd, a bright green light appears. Soon enough, a huge green explosion occurs, destroying everything in its path. The bells of a nearby church began to ring as the explosion was heard by everyone in the city. The people were coming out of their homes, shouting that there had been an explosion as a battalion of soldiers made their appearance. They headed towards the scene of the explosion and could see a huge smoke cloud in the distance. As the soldiers were watching the smoke, Dolores made her appearance, questioning them on what was going on and whether there were any casualties. One of the soldiers reports to her that they were still investigating the remnants of the explosion, but the issue is that there was almost no evidence due to the explosion from earlier on. In the aftermath of the explosion, the place where Vikir was is now covered by multiple people along with a huge crater in the middle of it. Dolores was meticulously exploring the area as well, seeing the explosion which can be seen as normal, the traces of the fight which were imparted on the orphanage building. As she looked around, she could only wonder what kind of evil was fought in this very place. As she continues to look around for clues, she notices something on the floor. It was a piece of our boy's mask. Part of it had been broken off. Upon seeing it, Dolores quickly kneels down to cover it with her skirt, hiding it from the nearby soldiers. One of them notices her strange actions and asks if she was feeling all right. Dolores, in her kneeling position, simply replies that she was feeling a bit sick. Continuing to cover Vikir's mask as the soldier reveals that there were no casualties and that she shouldn't push herself, Dolores was in a panic mode. After all, she was flustered and hid part of the mask because she knew that it belonged to the night bloodhound. 
We start off this part back with Professor Snape, who appears with an annoyed look on his face as usual. It turns out that we're back in the classroom, where a giant scorpion-like creature, the size of your mama, oh snap, lies on the table beside him. It turns out that the professor was finding out which student was responsible for writing a specific report that he was sent, and discovers it to be his least favorite student, our boy, Vikir. The report was apparently about the scorpion-like creature that lay dead on the table in the classroom. In the report, it was written that Vikir had written about how Venipians, the name of the creature, has an undiscovered second venomous fangs. This kind of information seemed like a false report to the professor, who regarded it as a joke with fake information, so he was going to deduct 10 points from everyone in the ice core. As part of a punishment to the one who held the theory rank 1, Vikir. Hearing about this, our boy couldn't help but panicked a bit as he realized that he actually made a mistake. It turns out that the information he had written in the report hasn't been discovered in the period he was in right now. Anyways, the professor was quick. He grabs onto a scalpel and proceeds over to the venopion, eager to cut it open to confirm if there really was a second venomous fang hidden in its abdominal exoskeleton, as written by Vikir in his report. If nothing came out of it, the entire ice core was going to have their points deducted and Vikir would end up humiliated. Taking the sharp scalpel that glimmers in the light, the professor points it exactly in the center of the venopion body, with just the tip, he makes a small incision, causing blood to flow out of it. The moment the scalpel made the cut, something quick and sharp shot out of the venopion's body, right towards the professor's head, giving him a headshot. All the students in the classroom were shocked by what happened in that brief moment, none of them could have predicted this happening. For some reason, the sharp needle, covered in a purple-like poison liquid, stopped just barely inches away from the professor's face, who was feeling terrified. He loses his dignity as he falls to the ground, screaming like a little girl over the fact that he almost died. It turns out that Vikir had saved his life by using his book as a shield, blocking the second poisonous fang that he had written about in his report from reaching the professor's face. With a calm look on his face, Vikir questions the professor if he had enough proof right now to validate his report. The professor was busy processing all the information in his head, he couldn't believe that there really was a second venomous fang. He also couldn't believe that a student saw a venopion and made a big discovery that could solve the cases of the mysterious deaths that had been happening for some time now. In order to regain his dignity, the professor decides to give all the members of the ice core one additional point. He even tells Vikri to come visit him in his research lab after class, in order to provide a more detailed explanation about his report. Hearing that there was no punishment, Vikir agrees to the professor's request. As he headed back to his seat at the back of the classroom, the students around him started to talk about Vikir, calling him amazing for knowing about the second venomous fang. His actions today started to change their minds about how they used to think that sports was the only cool thing in school, but now, thanks to Vikir, being smart was slowly becoming cool. But other students chime in during the discussion, recalling that Vikir was also good at sports, after all, he went against Tudor and Sancho during the match from the other time. Finally reaching his seat, PG tells him that he had done a good job, while the students realized the most important thing about our boy. Which is the fact that behind the nerdy glasses, he was actually hiding his amazing looking face and glowing hair. Ignoring the noise from his classmates, Vikir began to close his eyes once again, recalling the massive explosion from yesterday night, when he was out hunting the demons at the orphanage. He actually did take on massive damage. The explosion was strong enough to burn off his skin on his body, arms and face, revealing his raw muscles underneath. He even had his hand completely blown off. But luckily, thanks to his skills, he was able to recover from the damages almost instantly. But it still hurts like a ton. Right after the explosion, Afibo had hidden his tracks, the only thing Vikir had gotten out of that interaction was the ledger in the headmaster's safe. The ledge had the location of the children who were used as food for the demons. Vikir could see that as the locations had no connections, he can't completely negate the possibility of more than one elite corpse in the capital. But more importantly was the mysterious shadowy figure he saw in passing yesterday, the one acting cool by standing alone on top of a nearby building from where he was. Vikir had seen him smiling from ear to ear, even wearing the same school uniform as he did. Which made our boy realize a very crucial clue, that amongst his fellow classmates in this room, there might be one of the ten elites in the academy. Comment below if you think that one of the ten elites is one of the new characters that have been introduced to us in this new season. Moving on from the demons, in the academy, there is a famous newspaper that exists within the capital. This newspaper's influence is immense, and every day the newspaper is released, it sell-outs rapidly. This is all thanks to the academy's newspaper club called Lukian, 
and the glorious president in charge of this excellent club is someone we are all familiar with, hint. She has blonde hair and a wing-like head accessory. Yes, it turns out to be third-year academy student president of Lukian, Dolores Lun Quo Vadis, who is excitedly welcoming the new members of her club. She knew that if they applied to Lukian, which is rumored to be difficult to enter, means that they were persistent to a certain level. So she excitedly orders for their introductions to begin. The first new member turns out to be first-year academy student, Tudor La Mancha Don Quixote, who tells everyone that he wishes to become an elite in both his class and in the club. The second new member turns out to be first-year academy student, Sancho Barataria, who tells everyone that he hates how people think he was just a big dumb brute, so he entered the club to become an intellectual. The third new member is first-year academy student, Sinclair, who tells everyone that money and information usually come hand in hand when it comes to power, but she ensures them that she entered the club because she thinks that information is more important. The fourth new member is first-year academy student, Bianca Fo Usher, her introduction was simple, telling everyone that she simply chose the club with the clearest vision, and that she was going to do her best. The fifth member is our boy's boy, first-year academy student, PG, who stutters in his introduction, but nonetheless, he shouts out loud that he enjoys gathering and analyzing information, which made him think that the newspaper club was the best fit for him. The last member to join is our boy, first-year academy student, Vikir, who lacks excitement in his introduction, simply tells everyone that it was a school rule that everyone must join a club, so he simply followed PG. But in truth, he had a secret agenda. Lukian, the famous newspaper club of the academy, was a place where he could easily obtain information. But that there was a catch, the saintess is here with him, making things slightly uncomfortable. After his introduction, Dolores singles him out of everyone, telling Vikir that he couldn't be a Lukian report with that half-assed attitude he showed, but as she scolds him, the member behind her notices something. She quickly brings out a newspaper article and shoves Dolores out of the way. In an excited tone, she questions Vikir if he was the one in the newspaper, as she actually found him familiar, and couldn't believe that such a famous student would join their club. It turns out that the club had written an article about our boy during the match, the title is, Exclusive. Who is the ice core freshman who appeared in the run flat match? An unknown freshman who attended yesterday evening's physical education class. Looking at the article, Vikir remained silent while Tudor laughed out loud. Pointing out that person captured in the photo was our boy. Even Dolores was clueless about when this report had been released. It turns out that the girl beside her was called Anna, a third-year academy student, and also the vice president of Lukian. She proudly tells Dolores that she had gotten information about a handsome freshman, so she finds that if she didn't release such information, then she couldn't call herself a reporter. After hearing that kind of answer, Dolores was defeated and took a step back. Anna took over the introduction, revealing to the first years that the second year students had already gone out to collect news, so she decided to start their activity with everyone that was present here now. Two articles were presented, with the day, month cancelled out. It was actually something that happened at the dawn of last night, a suspicious unidentified assailant appeared and burned down a certain orphanage in town, down to the ground. Everyone in the club was now sitting around a table, reading articles presented to them. PG was the first to know what it was, and questions if the article given to them was about yesterday's explosion in the capital. Anna reveals that it was true and that on the day of the incident, she had obtained news when he went outside the academy. She further tells PG that the club had hypothesized that the person behind this incident and that the one behind the recent murder in the capital were the same person. What's shocking about the incident at the orphanage, was that the majority of the children's bodies at this organ gauge had been identified. After hearing about it from Anna, PG quickly whispers into Vikir's ear, asking him if he thinks that the mysterious person they were looking for was the one responsible. Our boy didn't reply back, but simply thought that the dead children's bodies were the doing of the demon that he was hunting. After revealing all the information about the incident, Anna decides that it was time for them to determine the headline of the article they'll be sending out. Everyone started to write down their ideas about what would be the best headlines, from the birth of a terrible villain greater than the appearance of a monster causing chaos outside the academy. What are the Imperial Guards doing? An unparalleled villain and a challenge to the Quo Vadis family, the children who died suspiciously. Who was the one behind this? After some time, Bianca was reading through what everyone wrote, and said that none of them were impactful enough. Tudor agrees with her words, wondering if it was because the villain's name was still unknown. Giving examples for cruel criminals who have nicknames like Jack the Ripper and Bluebeard were given to them. Anna calls out Tudor's idea for giving the villain a nickname good which immediately made him give out his idea of a nickname, which was the Death Scythe Shadow Master. 
which Anna immediately rejects, calling it a shit nickname and sending Tudor down into a sadness spiral. And so, the group started to come out with various nicknames, ranging from the explosion demon that brings misfortune, which was too long, so another suggestion was the orphanage killer, which sounded impactful, while another suggestion was Mr. Terrorist. As the group started to debate against one another over which nickname was best suited for the villain, Dolores was eerily silent, not speaking a single word during the entire discussion. The first words she spoke during this session were the words, the night bloodhound. It turns out that after reading about the incident in the article, she recalled the mask that she had picked up at the scene which definitely belongs to the night bloodhound, making her wonder why he was there at that time. After seeing him in person, she found him as a type of person that didn't want any type of rank or wealth. He even diligently treated the people of the slums who had the red death. She could see that his devotion and love towards the poor people were real. Because of those actions, Dolores had thought that Vikir had stolen the saintess tear for a great cause, but his appearance at the scene of the incident made her question his true nature. Making her believe that he might have really killed the headmaster and the children at the orphanage. But she believes that what she saw at the slums was accurate and that he wasn't evil, if the night bloodhound is a criminal, then she was sure that he would have his reasons. Distracted by her thoughts, Anna actually hears the name Dolores had spoken out by mistake which catches her attention. Looking up to the table, she saw that everyone was staring at her. They all liked the nickname of the Night Bloodhound as it was a barbarian tribe's naming style, which sounded really violent. The rest of the group agrees with the nickname, finding it gloomy and negative, perfect for a criminal. Dolores immediately covers her mouth, embarrassed that she had mistakenly mumbled the Night Bloodhound's name out loud to everyone. Seeing that the nickname was settled, Anna suggested the title of the article to be Who is the Night Bloodhound, that's filling the capital with fear. But Dolores was quick to defend the Night Bloodhound, reminding Anna that the Lukian articles must only contain the truth, and that it hasn't been confirmed yet if that person is the criminal. As the president and vice president battled it out, Tudor turns to Vikir, asking about his opinion on something. Tudor wanted to know about Vikir's thoughts on whether the Night Bloodhound was evil or not. Our boy simply replied that he didn't care about that, but in his mind, he couldn't believe that he would hear the saintess say the name of the night bloodhound out loud like that. Not accepting the answer that he didn't care, Tudor goes in for a hug, forcing Vikir to choose if he really had to. Seeing that Tudor wanted a real answer, Vikir thought about it seriously for a moment. So he changed his answer and spoke these words. What I know for certain is that they're not virtuous, so they're evil. Just as Tudor was about to agree with Vikir's words, Dolores slams her hand heavily onto the table, catching their attention. She was standing upright, shocked by Vikir's words that the night bloodhound isn't virtuous. Her eyes were completely focused on our boy, asking him about how he was so sure about that. Seeing her reaction, Vikir was actually stunned and confused by what was going on. Even Tudor's hand was sweating heavily as he let go of Vikir's shoulder, sensing the danger that our boy might be in. We start this chapter once again with Dolores questioning Vikir on why he thinks that the Nightblood isn't a good guy, her questioning was making everyone on Vikir's side nervous as they started to sweat over her words. Dolores's eyes were set on their target, showing us why it was drawn as a cross eye, she continues to question Vikir's on why he was so sure about his words. Knowing who he was, she continues to ask Vikir to answer her questions, but he remains silent, while Tudor starts to think that he had done something wrong. Seeing and hearing no attempts at a reply, Dolores addresses everyone in the club, claiming that they believed in something without any proof. She reminds them that as reporters, if they say things that aren't proven by facts, then they can destroy an innocent person's life. Tudor cuts in, informing her that the guards of the city had testified that the night hound had destroyed the buildings and killed the headmaster of the orphanage. But Dolores refutes their claim, telling Tudor that the Imperial Guard's interview responses are just testimony consisting of deductions and no solid evidence. She even reminds him that the question regarding the children's corpses that were found in the orphanage's basement has yet to be resolved. And that there were too many questionable variables to determine that the night hound killed those children. The girls on the other hand were stunned by how determined Dolores was in proving them wrong about the night hound, even worried about it. Seeing her so determined to prove the right facts, they couldn't believe that she was staying neutral even though this happened in an orphanage that's managed by her own family. Seeing that no one else was complaining, Dolores turns to Anna reminding her to edit the article to ensure that it's objective and unbiased. Hearing that order, Anna complains that if they do that, they wouldn't be able to write anything. But Dolores insists on it, saying that it wasn't too late to release a critical report that it was the night hound after what they had found about the incident. Her eyes started to look sad as she thought about what if the night hound really was evil, 
and reminded the club that if that was true, then they can criticize him harshly. Hearing those words, Vikir couldn't help but take a peek at her through his thick nerd glasses. As the group starts to take in Dolores's words, another member of the club bursts into the room, shouting for the president's attention. The member reports to her that the club advisory was asking for her, stating that the reason was because he wanted her to re-edit the report and state that the night hound was a bad person. Hearing about the request, Dolores started to feel stressed, and replied back to the member that she was going to talk to the club advisor, since he likes making articles into headlines. After settling things in the room, Dolores left with the member to seek out the club advisor and his request. As she left, Tudor was impressed by their president, calling her a girl boss, hearing that, Vikir couldn't help but reply that Dolores had been that way since a long time ago, which confuses Tudor. In Vikir's mind, Dolores looked the same as when she led the Holy Knights on the front lines of the battlefield during the fall before he had regressed. She wore mighty armor and her holiness radiated in a bright light all over. She could be seen on the battlefield, ushering new commands to the Holy Knights, ordering them to push forward as she blesses them with her holy light. She would often complain about the troops, a sign that people these days have weak faith. She even scolds them when she finds them messing around their breaks, telling them to save lives instead. She reminded them that back in her days, if a demon had appeared, then they would just jump in to help. Recalling his past memories of her, Vikir started to smile to himself, he had thought that she would deem his actions as wicked, but to him right now, it doesn't feel bad because someone's trying to tell the truth about him. In his heart, he quietly thanks the saintess for her help, as she argues with the club advisor over his request, who turns out to be Professor Snape. Moving on, in the earlier mornings, a siren started to blare loudly. As it continues to ring, PG awakens from his beauty sleep in a groggy state. The moment he raises his body upright, Vikir greets him with a good morning. Vikir was already up and ready, dressed in his school's exercise clothes and stretching, while PG was still rubbing his eyes, greeting good morning back to our boy. In this academy, everyone has to wake up at 6 a.m. When the alarm sounds, the stupidest head to the training area in front of the dorms. The students then participate in the exercises, following the instructor who stands at the front to wake themselves up. They start off their day with a light jog. After their morning exercises, the students will go their separate ways. Some would catch up on their sleep, some would go and take a bath, and some head straight to the cafeteria. PG could start to feel the strain on his body after the morning exercises, he complains to Vikir that his brain would be more active if he had slept through the morning exercises, but our boy refutes that claim, reminding PG that moving his body helps to activate his brain. But that wasn't what PG wanted to hear, he didn't want to be proven incorrect. Tudor cuts into their conversation, telling Vikir that he wasn't going to be popular with the girls if he didn't act so empathetic, and suggests that he practices it by being empathetic to PG. But hearing that suggestion, PG humbly declines the idea. Tudor then comes up with a new suggestion, asking if everyone is free this weekend, as they should have fun by going into the city. PG likes the idea behind it as there was actually a book he needed to buy. Even Sancho chimed into the conversation, saying there was a restaurant that he wanted to try in the city too. Hearing that it was okay with the rest, Tudor turns to ask Vikir. Pausing for a moment, our boy declined the invitation, saying that he needed to volunteer on the weekends. The group was stunned to hear that Vikir needed to do volunteering, PG reveals that our boy had received too many deductions. Hearing about that, Tudor realized that it was probably from Professor Snape, who would pick on Vikir all the time, even if he didn't do anything wrong. Hearing them talk about him, Vikir couldn't help but remain silent. So he moves on from the group, telling them to go to the city without him this time. But the moment he left them, the group started to chase after our boy, changing their plans because all of a sudden, they found volunteering fun. PG calls out to Vikir, telling him that his friends, they couldn't let him do it all alone, Sancho even reminds them that the more, the merrier. But as they followed behind Vikir closely, Tudor started to realize something unusual, drawing Sancho's attention as well as asking what it was. Tudor tells him that when Vikir is around, he naturally gravitates towards him, it was as though Vikir had the aura of an older brother. Hearing that, Sancho adds in, saying that even though Vikir was a quiet boy, he has that sigma riz about him that simply exudes charisma, back when he was a mercenary, Sancho felt that such people were natural leaders. Even PG understood what the boys were saying about our boy, he couldn't help but smile to himself, after all, he found Vikir amazing. Amazing people like Tudor, from the physically great Don Quixote family, and Sancho, the transfer student from the Northern Mercenary Guild approach him first. Vikir was also kind, 
he had helped PG at the entrance party when he was having a difficult time, and he was perfect in his studies and training. PG felt that as long as he was with Vikir, then he had a feeling that everything he does in life would be possible. But as they walked along the corridors, Vikir's bloodhound bloodthirst leaked out, he looked to the side, eyes red and unleashing his murderous aura. Since he was standing right beside him, PG immediately started to feel afraid when he saw Vikir this way. Ignoring everyone else's presence, Vikir could sense the disgusting aura that the demons gave off, covering the entire walkway they were in. The stench of this horrible aura was coming from a group of a guy and two girls walking away from them. Vikir continues to monitor that group as they slowly walk away from him. Knowing that PG was basically a human dictionary, Vikir asks him if he knew about other students well, and if specially, he knew about the guy that walked past them just moments ago. Jolted by the sudden request, PG asks if Vikir was talking about the guy between the two female students a moment ago, as he knew that guy well. Apparently, he was the most handsome guy in this school, a sophomore called Bane Kodzak. Vikir started to grit his teeth hard, after all, he didn't think that they would be this active within society. A member of the ten elite corpses was right in front of him. As the suspect started to move further away, Vikir started to think about his choices right now, whether he should start the fight, but thinking about it, he decided not to as there would be a lot of casualties. Especially his group, where he couldn't allow the future heroes to get hurt. Sensing that something was off about our boy, the three guys were worried about him, asking Vikir about what was wrong. Our boy simply tells them that he wasn't feeling well, and that he was going to rest. Before engaging in a fight against one of the ten elite corpses, Vikir decides to gather information first. He moves away from the group, using the skill in his second slot called Silent Heal Mashusu. Like Superman removing his glasses to change clothes, our boy did the same, while thinking that he should follow Bane closely behind. But because he was distracted by his thoughts, he doesn't see Dolores coming down the stairs beside him, resulting in a clash between the future titans. A loud scream from Dolores catches the attention of the boys as they gasp in shock over what happened. They could all see that Dolores had fallen to the ground, hurt by something as she waves her hand in pain, while Vikir stood there, stunned by what had just happened. Tudor and the boys rushed over, asking Dolores if she was okay. Tudor immediately tells Vikir to apologize to the president which he did immediately while bowing his head down to her. But Dolores was completely fine with it and didn't need an apology as she also found herself being careless, as she was being helped by Sancho, she couldn't believe how muscular Vikir was, after bumping into him, it felt like she had hit a wall. Looking at our boy as he wears back his glasses, she notices that she couldn't sense his presence at all either, making her wonder who Vikir truly is. Seeing that there were too many people gathered here today, Vikir decides to postpone his plans of following and tailing Bane. Knowing that he was probably the one of the ten elite corpses. Deep down the academy staircases, Bane could be seen leading the two girls into the darkness. Even the girls started to feel that something was off about this place, so they questioned him on why he had brought them to such a dark place. Instead of answering their worries, Bane simply tells them that he had some sad news which captures their attention completely as they were worried about him. He starts to tell the girls a story, about how recently, a certain guy had showed up in the school, and since then, he had been messing with him, and because of him, he hasn't been able to eat properly. The girl on his left was quick to defend Bane after hearing the story, telling him that if he was being bullied then she wouldn't forgive the guy in his story. He continues on with his story, knowing about that guy, Bane decided to go see who he was one day, but he was wearing his school uniform by mistake, so he ran away instead. So the guy might have seen that he was one of the academy students. The girl on his right side was even more determined, telling Bane that if the guy comes to the school, then they'll stop him, as the two girls were always on his side. Hearing about how good these girls were to him, Bane thanks them, telling the girls that their hearts were as beautiful as their faces, and that they would always be together. From now on, that is. The moment he said those words, Bane immediately grabbed onto the faces of the two girls with his bare hands at the same time. He started to recall the pandemic mask-wearing bastard. Bane knew that he had the skill of a high-ranked graduator, so he was sure that our boy didn't die from the explosion like that. He could also see the way Vikir was attacking the places that were connected to the location he had eaten people from before. Which made him realize that Vikir was a human that was able to sense the presence of a demon. As he said this, the two girls' faces started to morph and change all over, they started to beg Bane but he ignored them completely. It turns out that Bane is really the demon that Vikir had been hunting for, his demonic side started to appear as he absorbed the girls' faces into his hands. 
Taking in all the facts, Bane realized that Vikir might be the one who has something to do with Andromalius's death. As he said this, the girl's eye and mouth appeared on the side of his face, begging for someone to save her. It is revealed that Bane's true name is Dantalion, the ninth corpse of the demon's ten elite corpses. He returned to see Vikir staring at something deeply, his attention completely drawn to it as someone speaks in the background. It turns out that our boy was back in the newspaper club room. It turns out that Anna was speaking to the first years, she was complaining about the numerous incidents that kept happening in the town recently. She continues to speak to the first years, revealing to them that she and Dolores had summarized the cases that had happened within the academy itself. Since they didn't have a lot of members available right now in Lucian, they wanted the first years like them to step up and fulfill this role instead. As she said this, Bianca and Tudor were distracted by the numerous cases written on the pieces of paper on the table in front of them, their eyes drawn towards them with a worried expression on their faces. Even Dolores was slightly worried as she read the report in her hand. Anna continues to give out orders to the young bloods, telling them to choose a case from one of the papers on the table. Their goal this time was to collect information and to write an article, once done, they were to bring it back to the club. As each member of the first years started to look through the papers regarding the incidents in the academy, PG was nervous, thinking that this was going to be his first article since entering Lucian, while Bianca, after reading quite a few of the cases, couldn't believe that there were this many, making her question what was going in the capital lately. One of the papers had the title, The Terrorists Forewarning, a terrorist had warned that they would poison the river of Venesior, the capital city of Rock. Another report was titled, Missing Handsome Theater Actor, the theater actor called Mr. B, disappeared on his way home after his play. It is highly likely that a stalker fan is behind this incident. Another report was titled, A Mysterious Murder Case, the head of a family has disappeared. Another report was titled, Murder Case, the murder that shall not be named. A certain person will be executed after hurting multiple people in the streets. They have said they were not behind it and are still pleading that their face had changed. Finally, the last report was titled, A Rapid Increase in Missing People, A Sudden Increase in Missing People in Venesior, No Suspects Have Been Found. Is the Night Bloodhound behind this? After reading all the reports, Vikir went to select one for himself. The incident report he picked was a missing persons case inside the academy. According to the report, three academy students have gone missing. Those three have always been seen together, so there are a lot of witnesses. Did they run away because of love? After reading the report, Vikir's immense bloodhound aura started to rupture, his eyes glowed with hate. Looking at one of the missing students in the report, he recognizes him as the guy he was chasing after yesterday, one of the elite corpse's potential suspects. We now change scenes to the middle of the night, in one of those random buildings. We see a husband and wife sleeping together in the same bed. But for some reason, the husband was wide awake at this late time. He slowly rose up from his bed, not disturbing his wife who was soundly asleep. He then sat in a chair beside a window. It's revealed that his eyes were not normal, it was green, like those of the elite ten corpses. Looking across the room, he asked someone a question. It turns out that he wasn't alone in the room at all, he had four members in front of him. He questions the group on whether they had found out something about the pandemic mask wearer who's interfering with their plans so far. It turns out that one of the members was Ephibo, who Vikir had fought in the previous nights, he silently mutters his report back to the husband. The second subordinate of the Ninth Corpse was called Geronto, who has red hair. Another subordinate was called Heva, who silently muttered and gave his report, while holding a massive pair of scissor-like weapons. The last of the group was a subordinate called Fido, who remained silent. It turns out that the husband is actually the real Ninth Corpse of the demon's ten elite corpses, called Dantalion. He takes notes of their reports, realizing that they hadn't seen the mask wearing vigilante since that day either, which made it seem like he was being very careful now. Transforming his hand into pieces where eyes and noses could be seen, Dantalion tells his followers that it couldn't be helped and to widen the scope of work from now on. Within a mere second, something shoots out from his demonic hand, hitting all four of the subordinates' faces at the same time. It turns out that Dantalion was going to share his faces with them causing their current faces to morph and change to what he wanted them to wear this time. As the four subordinates wore new faces, Dantalion issued a new order, telling them to go into the areas with more light and find the person who was wearing the pandemic mask. But as he gave the order, the door to the room slowly opened. In a twist of fate, his wife had actually woken up from her sleep, and found him in this room. She looked confused, questioning Dantalion on what he was doing so early in the morning, and wondered who the other four people were in this room. 
The demon simply looked at her, not uttering a single word at first. As he closed his eyes, he talked about how he wanted to admire her face being alive for a little while longer, but seeing her and finding this out, left him with no choice. He orders Fido, who appeared right behind the wife in an instant, with a blade across her neck, to make sure her face remains untouched. The clueless wife could do nothing against them as she felt the cold stainless steel blade against her neck. After a single moment, the sound of flesh being cut could be heard as blood covered the floor. As she laid on the floor, bleeding from her wound, the wife couldn't make a single sound and could only cry as tears fell from her face. Dantalian didn't feel anything about this and continued to talk to his team about how the plan to open the gate has gradually been delayed due to Andromalus's death and the person who was wearing the pandemic mask. As he sat in his chair, Dantalian started to morph and change his own face, calling their current situation annoying. After his face changed, he ordered Ephibo to follow him, as they needed to see someone special. His face is finally revealed, as he scratches his chin, thinking that he should go and relieve his pent-up stress. The scene changes once again, this time, to a place with a slight holy feeling to it. Dantalian appears once again, this time, with a smile on his demonic face while wearing a cross on his neck and a priest outfit. Someone stood in front of him, asking him about why he was smiling, Dantalian replies that he simply couldn't help himself. After all, he had the beautiful saintess standing in front of him. It turns out to be Dolores, who wasn't amused by his remarks, as she tells him that she didn't come to see him to joke around, calling him as Sir Quilty. Brushing her remarks aside, Dantalian tells her that he was worried because her visits have become scarce lately. Dolores tells him that recently, there have been a lot of murders and missing people, which was why she has been busy, since she was covering them. Hearing this, the holy man could see that her club activities have gotten busy, as the world was becoming a more and more brutal place to be in. As he smiles at her, Dantalian knew that the one responsible for all these horrible things was him. Looking at him, Dolores couldn't help but feel nervous about something. She knew the man before him as Quilty Loon Indulgentia, the head of the Indulgentia family, the collateral bloodline to the Quo Vadis family. They were currently volunteering and managing Quo Vadis's resources at the orphanage, monastery, and hospital, but they were also supporting the exemption system, that erases the winds of the sinful rich. So she knew that this two-faced person in front of her was definitely hiding something. As he leans closer to her face, Dantalian questions Dolores about why she needed to speak with him. She reveals to him that she came here to request for the exemption system to be abolished. She found it wrong to exempt a person from all their sins just because they were wealthy. He refutes her statement, saying that there was nothing wrong with the system as the exemption policy has been in the church up until now. He also found that donating a large sum of money was already a large form of punishment. But Dolores wasn't budging from her stance, she counters his argument by stating that sins are something you must expose yourself for in front of God, and forgiveness was only given once you have received the appropriate punishment. With the holy light radiating brightly behind her, she ends her argument, saying that the people affected by the exemption system cannot be saved. Her final words left Dantalian speechless as his mouth was left open. But he quickly closes it, turning away from Dolores, and reminding her that he was simply following the church's doctrine, and that her best course of action was to speak directly to her father, the leader and cardinal of the church. As he continues to face away from her, Dantalian tells her to return, since he heard that the academy students were coming here to volunteer today. So there was no need for them to have a fight within the Quo Vadis family in front of her juniors. Dolores accepts his proposal, but tells him that she would come back later so they could discuss this matter even more. As she left the church, Dantalian's transformation was leaking out, his face was riddled with multiple eyes as he looked back at her, grinning widely. His demonic side was going haywire as his thoughts were filled with how beautiful Dolores looked. He had almost given in to his impulses and collected her face, but he needed to hold himself back, clenching his teeth so hard that they bled. He saw Dolores, the saintess, as the finest product that he had discovered in this world. Dantalian wanted to collect her face when her face was in despair, after the chaos descended into this world. He continues to tremble with his impulses, holding himself back, as he wanted to open the gate as soon as possible. He begs his fellow brethren to hurry and descend the chaos into this world, so he can claim what he wants. The scheme changes to Vikir standing alone in front of a gate belonging to a huge building. He looks around wondering if this was it. Based on the report given to him by Cindy, this was the orphanage that she had found after analyzing Andromalus's ledgers. Which meant it was highly likely that this place was connected to the ten elite corpses. Looking at the flag being raised, 
Vikir could see that this place was probably the property of the Quo Vadis family. If a demon is planted within the Iron Blood family, and the Holy Divine family, then it is also highly likely there were demons hiding amongst the other families. After the explosion, the Night Bloodhound had garnered attention, so Vikir wanted to use volunteering as an excuse to slowly investigate the students. Speaking of the students, some of those students appeared by his side. It turns out to be PG, Tudor and Sancho, looking at the building in front of them, he wondered if this was the orphanage they were going to volunteer at. Tudor wraps his arm around Vikir, telling him how lucky he was to have friends that were willing to volunteer with him, but our boy didn't want this, telling them that he didn't ask for them to follow him. Letting out a deep sigh as a nervous sweat drop drips down his face. With the presence of these three dudes, our boy could feel that things were going to get annoying. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.